let's make sure we have everybody. So, you know, before we start, so Newsdays said they were late. I don't know if they're here. I'm here. Oh, yeah, okay, you made it. All right, good. There you are. And, and uh, there's one other station that was late. And they're here? Okay, so then we don't have to wait. I wasn't going to wait anyway, but, you know, if they step in, they step in. We might have to go over a few things. I don't know. All right, when you're ready, you tell me, and I'll tell you I'm ready. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. We're here today because new information has been, uh, has arisen in this case from witnesses who were so far unknown. Those witnesses, of which there are four, have given us statements, two of whom have given us affidavits regarding this case, regarding Rex Uriman and Shannon Gilbert and Karen Varg uh, Vergata. Before I talk about them, first, I want you to be aware that here stands the commissioner, as you know, with me. And up until now, we have not made it known to the public that we have been working together on this case steadily since the time that I came to know Commissioner Harris a year ago, February. Uh, we, up until that point, the police department was very resistant to receiving any kind of evidence or information from my office, from what I was doing. That all changed significantly when uh, Commissioner Harris stepped in and we uh, began to collaborate. And we've collaborated ever since. That collaboration has had fruit. And that fruit, at least, are the witnesses I'm going to be talking about today, as well as other evidence and information which we have shared together and with the police department, uh, and this, uh, therefore with the task force. So it is true to say that our cooperation has given rise to more substantial, valuable evidence in the entire case of the Long Island serial killer. So with that in mind, I'm very pleased that, that Commissioner Harrison has seen fit to open his mind and, and to do what I'm suggesting has been done, uh, contrary to all those who have come before him. And he's approaching this case in the right way. He's the right man for the job, and he's done his job well. As to the witnesses, as to the evidence, in no particular order of importance, because so much of it is important, I have stood as a beacon to, as a civilian beacon, to the people who are involved in this case to come and talk where they didn't want to approach the police out of fear, out of tra apprehension. Uh, out of a natural, some, in some cases, a natural distaste for the police department because of the work these people were in. So they would then come to me and speak to me, and I would interview them, and we would then cooperate, I, them, and the police department. And so with that in mind, the first two witnesses I'm going to talk about are, uh, both of them uh, are not Suffolk County residents. I should point out that uh, we obtained from these two affidavits, their names will go unmentioned, their, their names are blotted out of the affidavits, but the affidavits will be available to you right after the press conference. As to the first one I'll talk about, this is a witness who has every reason to have no bias, no interest in the case whatsoever. She was not a sex worker is not a sex worker, and instead, back in the 90s, in the 1990s, she was what is known then and now as a swinger. She would have a sex partner, and they would go to certain sex clubs in New York City where they would switch partners with other people of like kind. One of the most important places that they would go was called La Trapeze on West 27th Street in New York, right near uh, 
uh, Rex Uerman's office. And this was a notorious place for swapping, for switching partners. Uh, sometimes several hundred people at a time would be involved in this place in its heyday. Its heyday was in the late 90s, uh, right at the time that uh, Karen Brigada is involved in this case. In this situation, this particular woman was uh, dating a police officer from New York City who was in narcotics, a detective, and uh, they would go to these, these switchy clubs, these swapping clubs. At a certain time, at, at or about Valentine's Day of 1996, I believe, uh, the, the, uh, the couple went to La Trapeze, and I think it was on the wall at La Trapeze where an advertisement wa uh, was placed to go to a house in Massapequa Park for partying, for switching, for swapping. She went with her boyfriend uh, out to Long Island. But before they went, her boyfriend picked up a, a woman in New York, in the city, who had apparently just gotten out of jail. And she was disheveled and hungry. And she was a sex worker. We don't know the details yet of how he came to know her, but he knew her. And she came in the car with the two of them. They went to Massapequa Park. Before they got there, they stopped at a gas station, and the girl who was with them expressed some apprehension about where they were going and why. Uh, that was all wiped out when it was pointed out that he's a police detective, so don't worry, no problem. They ended up going to Rex Uriman's house. In the house was the wife of Rex Uriman and uh, Rex Uriman and the, the, the other girl. The other girl who we believe to be Karen Vergata. She, this girl, disappears downstairs at the house. Rex Uriman disappears. And according to our witness and other witnesses I've talked to, when men are swingers with their, their partner, very often they switch sexually. They go back and forth between male and female. And so Uriman leaves the main floor and disappears either into another bedroom or downstairs. It's not clear. And the witness talks to Rex's wife. She doesn't want to have sex like she had expected uh, to occur because our client believes because our client is an African-American woman. And Uriman didn't like that. Uh, Ellerup, rather, didn't like that. So there was no sex between them, as was originally planned. Instead, the sex is between Uriman and the other man. At some point, the witness goes looking for her partner and is kind of upset that he doesn't emerge. He emerges, and finally they leave, and kind of in a hurry. But when they leave, as they're leaving, the witness points out that she could see in the window, looking out, the girl the, that had come with them. And she says to her, her uh, driver, her, her partner, what are we doing? Are we taking her? And the partner says, don't worry. They're just playing a game. She stays there. No problem. With that, the girl runs out of the house naked and is running in front of the garage. And now the witness says, hey, shouldn't we be taking her? Something's wrong here. And the driver tells her, no, nah, they're just playing a game. Leave it. And they leave. She never hears about the incident again. She distinctly remembers Uriman. She also had intercourse with Uriman that, that same day. And uh, she kind of you know, buries it, forgets about it. Until on TV, she sees the picture 
of Karen Vergata. And she recognizes her and said, that's her. And she recognizes Rex Uerman. And so she comes forward, forward, and I meet her. I interview her at great length. Um, I also had the police department. Uh, we, we arranged for detectives to interview her. And I found her story. I interviewed her for three times for a total of nine hours. And uh, I found her story to be credible. She also mentioned that Rex would go out in the backyard and start a fire at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning in a big barrel that was outside in the back. And she was worried about that, too, that it would attract police. Anyway, she seemed credible. She appears to be credible. And she was willing to sign an affidavit to that effect. And that affidavit will be available to everybody. In, and in the details I've just told you, you will find there. The second witness who's come forward. This woman is not a sex worker, never was. She's not a switcher or swapper. She's not involved in any sexual activities whatsoever. She has nothing to gain by coming forward. She's not looking for a book or money or the usual things that you're hearing about out there. None of that. But she came forward because she's very disturbed about what she knows after she also saw uh, Rex Uerman on television and Shannon Gilbert. And here is her story. She's a, she is a uh, banker by day, and at night she worked extra in Suffolk County as a taxi driver to take care of her family you know, with a one-parent family. As a taxi driver, she is called from her dispatcher to go to the Sayville Motor Lodge on Sunrise Highway, that infamous place that the commissioner here busted a year ago and for, for uh, prostitution and other illegal activities. She's called to go to that place and that there's a girl awaiting her in, who's locked in a bathroom and will come out if she flashes her lights and beeps the horn. And she goes there and does that several times. It doesn't work. But then suddenly, a giant man who fits the description of Rex Uerman comes out, and he's covering his face with his arms so he can't be seen, and he runs to a van uh, or a, an SUV right nearby that's parked right there. She continues to flash her lights and beep her horn, and out comes a girl crying, shaking, very upset, and gets in her car. There they talk for a while, and then eventually they drive to the Ronkonkoma, I believe, Ronkonkoma Railroad Station so that this girl can go back in to New York City. This girl uh, was a sex worker who was servicing the big man, and uh, the man had seduced her into coming to Sayville by several times over the telephone convincing her that he would he was just a nice man who was going to help and work uh, with her to help her family her mother her sisters and her boyfriend Shannon has a mother sisters and a boyfriend at that time she had her hair pulled back and uh, because she often wore wigs this girl turns out to be Shannon Gilbert. Now, Shannon is lured into doing this particular tryst, and she's given uh, an envelope or shown an envelope by the man that looked like it was stuffed full of money. And he tells her there's $1,000 in there. It's for you and your family no matter what happens tonight. She looks in the envelope when he goes to the bathroom, and it's stuffed with paper. And so she panics and realizes something's wrong. So she goes in the bathroom, and he had become very aggressive, very angry. She goes in the bathroom, locks the door, and calls to get a cab. And that's how she comes out. They speak for over an hour. So the driver knows her well and notices that she has a drooping eye, uh, which is characteristic of Shannon uh, and also a characteristic of her, her family, by the way, uh, going back for, for a, a generation or two. 
And so she no- notices that, and it helps her to remember Shannon when she sees her later on. That's the first part of the story. It doesn't end there. This is part two. Several days or weeks later, it's not clear, and this is all occurring in the fall of 19... I'm sorry, in the fall of uh, 2009. This is all occurring. Uh, she... The driver gets another call from the same dispatcher and says that there's a man named Matt who she's to pick up uh, right off of exit 59 in the expressway and uh, he would be by, he would be at a bar that was there by, I guess, Ocean Avenue, somewhere over there. She goes there, pulls up on a side street at, between the bar and a house right next to it, and she sees a girl in a window and then she sees to the right of her a man, a huge man, rising up, coming to the car. He's dressed in camouflage, and he look leans in and then jumps in the back seat, sits on the edge, and leans over and starts talking to her, and she's watching him very carefully in the mirror. And she recognizes him as the same guy that was at the motel a, a, a little while before. And she now knows him to be, she recognizes him from the... Uh, from the media as Rex Hewerman. He says to her that he wants her to take her on a uh, take him on a long trip into the woods. In other words, he changed the destination she had been told, which caused her immediately to become suspicious, and he was very upset, very angry, and he began to dispute with her when she said, I'm not going on a long trip anywhere. And uh, with that he gets extremely angry and threatens to kill her and tells her, I already want to kill you, just give me a reason. And he had a gun, a handgun. She says, I'm not going anywhere at this point, and she turns off the car, and she says, you can have the keys, you can have my money, whatever you want, just let me go, I'll let you have whatever you want. With that, her dispatcher is on the the radio, and he says out loud, we know, we see you, we hear you, we can tell who you are, and the man panics, gets out of the car. She's then able to drive away. She encounters a police car coming the other way. She believes that the police officer was called uh, by a 911 caller on that issue. Could have been the girl who was in the house right next door from where she was. But comes the police, driving slowly with his lights off. She tells him the story, and the man had on a lanyard with a placard of some kind, as if he were a police officer. And she asked him, are you a cop? And he said, yes, she said, from where? He said, Brooklyn. With those facts in mind, she tells the police officer who's driving, there's one of yours back there, and it looks like he's had a bad day, so you better go see what's what, words to that effect. She later on hears from her dispatcher that he, this man, Uh, went into the woods and fired off his pistol twice. And she recognizes him very clearly to be Rex Uriman when she sees him. So she's given us this affidavit as well. There's a pattern that's developing here of Rex Uriman uh, being somebody who traces down, tracks down people and and haunts them. Uh, and, And Shannon Gilbert would therefore be no exception. Now, The third witness has not given a statement yet. The third witness contacted me from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And that witness clearly recalls being picked up. She was a a street walker. She gets picked up by Rex Uriman uh, in in Queens. And he drives, I think, near the, uh, the big center there in Queens. And he drives her into a park in Flushing where he makes her keep her head down at all times, commit oral sex, and then he has a pistol in his hand and tells her, get out of the car or I'm going to kill you. And don't do anything except what I tell you to do or I'm going to kill you. So she gets out of the car and he tells her, before she does, he tells her, I want you to pick up another person, another customer. She gets out of the car and immediately pulls up a another SUV and a man driving it, an African-American man, and 
the the guy that picks her up is white, and she gets in the other guy's car, and the driver Rex Hurman follows the car. They go, finally, get out of the car, because she panics and pulls the wheel because she sees a cop car coming. So the cop sees them go jaggedy off the road, and the cop stops them. The cop then goes back, talks to Rex and the other driver who gets out and walks back. The cop comes back and tells her, lady, if you want to make a complaint, you have to go to the precinct and drives away. That's her story. She also has no reason. She refuses to come forward. She refuses to have herself identified. I know her name. I know her address. I've given it to the police. They're aware of it, and presumably they're investigating it. Uh, you see the pattern. There's a pattern of a guy who likes to play kind of sporting games with, with the sex workers, chases them, haunts them, hunts them. That's what we're looking at here, we believe, anyway. Um, the fourth witness, and I'll finish on that, she comes from another state, and she's contacted me as well. I have very lengthy notes and recordings of what we discussed she was a sex worker for many years, uh, back in the time when all of these killings were occurring, and she serviced Rex Uriman. She said that she would service Rex Uriman over 20 times, and that he, would ha he was a serial user of sex workers. He would sometimes have them come two at a time to his house, and his wife was home, upstairs, and in one instance, got very angry at one of the sex workers because the wife believed that the worker had stolen an iron from, you know, for ironing clothes and had uh, had it in the car with the driver. So the driver had to get out. Everybody had to search the car. There was no iron. But but the, the wife knew about it and knew about, obviously, what was going on in order for that to happen. So she says that in her experience with, with, with Uriman, he was never impolite. He was always nice. He was always funny. He, he treated her well, and there was no violence. But he certainly had contact with Rex constantly for a period of several years. That's as much as I'm able to tell you. There's plenty of other new evidence, which I think it will take too long at this press conference to discuss. There's plenty of new other evidence that's similar in kind and consistent in, with the kinds of things that I've just described to you. So with that thought, I'm hoping that the police department will continue <coughs> along with the, um, the task force, that they will continue to look into these things, investigate them thoroughly, make the synapses that haven't been made so far, connect them up and connect the dots as it were, and I think we're getting to where we want to go. Lastly, I am still working on this case. Today I took Joseph Brewer's deposition, the John for Shannon Gilbert. I just finished it and came here. I'm still actively pursuing this case on my own as well as cooperating with the police department and the task force. But for people out there who have information and are afraid to come forward to the police, they can talk to me, they can reveal whatever they want, I will reveal it to no one. I reveal these things with their permission, the things that I told you about. But anybody else that still has information, I'm available. My door is open. My phones are open. I can help you. Thank you. You know, I don't want to uh, make Rex Truman the prime suspect. I, I will say this, and uh, I'll, I'll share this over and over again. Uh, the creation of the task force uh, got us into a good place of being able to identify Rex for uh, three of the uh, sex workers that were discovered, and we're looking very good uh, for the fourth one. Uh, but we also added two more investigators to the task force to take this type of information in and to pursue it, to follow it, to see if this is credible. Uh, that's very important, and that's why uh, people don't understand. When I first came into this position, uh, I sat down with John Ray, 
uh, myself and the members of the task force to have that conversation about information that he may have and, and let's make sure we're uh, putting a, a dragnet out there regarding any information that's coming to us. That's why I'm going to continue my partnership with John. And if people have a reluctancy to come forward to law enforcement and they want to go to John Ray, then it's important that we take this information and then we follow forward with uh, furthering the investigation. So I believe this is credible I'll, uh, it's still an ongoing investigation. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Well, once again, is this we have the information, we're working it, and uh, we'll see where it leads us down the road. Absolutely, and that's and that's a very good question, and uh, that's why I stand here today with John Ray. Uh, you know, if people uh, don't want to use our Crime Stoppers hotline, and they feel a lot more comfortable going to John Ray or, or anybody else. You know, I, I want to make sure that people understand uh, that we have a job here as law enforcement, as the Suffolk County Police Department, to make sure we investigate every single uh, complaint or interest in this case. Uh, make sure that we look under every single stone to see if there is any connection to Rex Yorman or if there is a connection to somebody else that may be involved with the bodies that were discovered on Ocean Parkway. So we could go about uh, about a month and a half, uh, two depending months, on two months, depending on each one. Uh, for one of the affidavits, I was actually sat down with the, the person myself. That just shows you my vested interest in it. Uh, you know, listen, this is something that's very important to me. Uh, I'm going to continue to grind to make sure anybody that had an interaction with our defendant, Rex Sherman, is held accountable in this case. Which witness did you sit down with, number one or number two? The, uh, the livery cab driver. The taxi driver. The taxi cab driver, yeah. That's the one with Shannon Gilbert. That's the one with Shannon Gilbert, yes, ma'am. Anybody else? Um, what year was that? 2007 or 2009? The, the, the taxi driver is 2009. The fall of 2009, and she is not absolutely certain of the time frame, but that's a, where it approximates. And that's where, Mary, that's where we're going to make sure we're doing our job and trying to nail down time frames, look at uh, uh, radio runs and other things that can help us kind of pinpoint uh, if there is any credibility to these complaints that come forward, that came forward. And the commissioner did send two detectives to interview the other witness with me, uh, which, which we did already and, and uh, at length. John or commissioner, uh, did any of these witnesses explain why they were now? Yes. Yeah, it was certainly a, a question we had to ask. Uh, you know, we have to ask many, many questions to test credibility. And, and I'm not saying that people would necessarily lie, although they might, but that they don't remember or they mix up facts with other, other situations. We had to test all of those things. And so we had to test that, too. And uh, in the one case with the, uh, the witness with the swapping, she, she just, she, it bothered her that they left behind this girl. But... She had no other reason to think anything of it until she saw this. She actually broke down. She couldn't believe it when she saw the picture and knew that girl. Uh, and that, that happened there. With the uh, taxi driver, the taxi driver did report it. The taxi driver, uh, back in when this originally happened, she, she talked to her. Uh, she, her cousin was a cop. She spoke to her family. She spoke to other taxi drivers. She told a lot of people about it. And then she did contact Crime Stoppers and, and report it and actually talked to them twice, but nobody called her back. So that's before, long before the commissioner was involved. So she did come forward and she said, well, you know, <laughs> she, when, it, when it got uh, reactivated, the issue, then she called me. Okay. So, you know, the way John explained it, and you got to just kind of take this into context, uh, she doesn't have a, a stake in the game. She's a um, cab driver at night, uh, had a profession during the day. You know, she's not necessarily 
from this neighborhood. So, you know, it's little things like that kind of piqued my interest. And uh, once again, is this, you know, why did she come forward and uh, her role and story and everything? It's, it's something that we need to take a closer look at and we need to make sure we're investigating it. And that's why the task force will stay in place. Uh, that's why we, we added more manpower to it. Uh, we're going to continue to work with our law enforcement partners and uh, see if there is any nexus to, um, uh, to our defendant, Rex Shearman. Or once again, like I said before, if there happens to be another subject out there, we'll, we'll look at them as well and see if we can hold them accountable. Well, it's, it's all the uh, bodies I've discovered. Let's not rule out Peaches, the Tyler, the, the Asian male. I, you know, those were the names uh, that I shared with Tony, but it doesn't mean that uh, we're not continuing to look at all the bodies that were discovered there. But uh, the ones right now that uh, J John has when it comes to uh, Ms. Vergata and when it comes to Ms. Gilbert are the ones that we're going to take a closer look at and see if they're connected to our defendant. Any update on the uh, fourth uh, victim, uh, Megan? Yeah, so I, I know our district attorney should be doing announcement uh, real soon, and uh, he'll keep you advised regarding if there's a, a nexus uh, to the uh, to the DNA that was recovered, and if there, if there is a match. So this witness one said that Rex had sex with both the woman you think that you forgot of, and this other man, a North Korean detective. So knowing that indicates he's probably potentially bisexual. Does that make him more of a leading suspect in the Asian male? Listen, any, anything is possible, uh, but once again, is this, this is something that we need to investigate. And I'm sure everybody can understand uh, there's a judicial process still going on. There's uh, ongoing investigation. Now that this information has been provided to us, I can only share but so much. Uh, but I will uh, reassure everybody here, we are not done with this investigation. I want to make sure that that's very clear. Well, I can't say he is, and I can't say he's not. I, he certainly reactivated interest in himself by what he did up on Bald Hill, uh, which, by the way, you should probably you probably know that it's a notorious place for men picking up other men. I've represented several clients from that hill for that very same thing, and Burke was a street smart cop. He's even noted in his disciplinary record for being extremely street wise. He would have known what goes on up on that hill, but he also would have known the risk he was taking, and he took it anyway. Burke, the risk taker, emerges, first of all, and second of all, Burke, who is interested in men, emerges, which is very much consistent with what I had said for years, that he was cross-dressing when he was with some of my clients, including uh, 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 Loretta Rickenbacker, uh, and that he had that other interest. Do, the, do those other interests matter? Sure they do. If you're going to look at the old police department and see w why did Burke get to where he went so easily, could it be that there's more sexual in improprieties on higher levels than we originally thought? It's something that should be looked into. We don't know. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. No. Did she only contact you after seeing Rex Shearman and Shannon Gilbert's face on TV? Yes, she contacted me after she saw uh, Rex Shearman on TV and Shannon Gilbert. And then she contacted me, and then I went to see her, and w she's from not from this state. Okay, so she claimed that she never saw Shannon Gilbert's face on, on TV or in the media prior to this year. That I don't know. I can't say she claimed that. I, I don't. I honestly don't remember what, whether I asked her that or not. All right, sorry. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks, everybody. We give you the uh, the affidavits.